This is a Ford EcoBoost 2.3 liter. Ah. Uh, it's built to handle about 700 horsepower. I'm just thinking about it loud going, I'd love to do a project with a four cylinder Ford. It's where we run into problems, folks, because I end up meeting people and now I get new ideas. Guys, welcome back to the Drift Games vlog. We're still here in LA and we're meeting up with one of the members of the Link ECU family, Justin Pollock. You guys will know him from Formula Drift. He's been in Formula Drift for a very long time and he's a guy close to my heart because he's a big Mustang guy. So we're going to go check out his workshop, have a little conversation, and do what we usually do root around and see if we can find anything interesting. So let's head inside. What's up, Justin? Hey, how's how are you? Doing? Good, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Rob. Nice to meet you too. Before we get into it, I was like, say we just come halfway around the world and we still run into a Suzuki Jimny. <laughs> they're, 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 they're just such a survivor car. Dude, you can literally drive that thing into the ground and it'll still go. And they're so they're just as small here as they are back home. <laughs> Except they have much bigger wheels here than they have back home. So you guys do a lot of off-roading, right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely into like off-roading for sure. So this is my little like daily commuter like little trail finder sort of deal. I picked it up just to find some like cool rock trails. and It's very cool. What I love about these is that uh, how close you sit to the passenger. It's like... Yeah, you're like rubbing <laughs> elbows constantly. <laughs> I'm like, yo, stay in your, stay in your lane over there. <laughs> Yeah. That's very cool. Well, thanks for having us at the shop. Yeah, I'm good. already I'm already intrigued because I'm straight into like we have Mustangs upon Mustangs. We got all sorts of muscle cars here. This is like, um, this is a bit of me now, which is a street Mustang? Yeah, yeah, just a uh, street car. I take it to like, I did a couple Optimas in it. It's a Roush P51. Uh, I kind of converted it to the P51D. Uh, I put an angle so, so on you're it. So we're gonna slow you right down. So what, what does a Roush Mustang so, mean? So this is a P51. They only made 51 of them, but this is actually the prototype. So it's oh, the, wow. like one of one, which is kind of rare. And what makes it so different? Obviously, it's got a kid, it's got a carbon. Yeah, it's it has like the, the Roush badging on the interior. Um, it has like the bomber jacket brown interior. Uh, a couple other like bits. The carbon like rear spoiler is like unique to this. And um, it looks awesome. The hood, the hood, the stock hood is a bit different, but I ended up putting like the Anderson to match the race car because yeah it's, it's pretty extreme thing. and what sort of power does this run on uh this does about like 750 wheel 750 so wheel kind of like moderate i guess moderate 750 wheel that's an 850 fly right Somewhere yeah right there. yeah 850 horsepower in on a street car moderate. but there's like stuff running around out here that are like thousand wheel on the street it's kind of nutty that is pretty nutty and speaking of nutty we have to obviously we have to go straight to the the pro car because <laughs> it's so weird because it's the first time i've seen it up close because obviously we watch formerly drift and we get to see all these cars but yeah i love having a quick look around them when you see them like this so this is a this is the good side so erwindale was a bit rough <laughs> on the other side like you can see what the wall looks like seems to be brought a bit back with you yeah yeah i did and left a bit too so so this is this is as i mean the thing about formerly drift cars for me is this is as far as you can go like within the rule book you're you're pushing right to the edge of it yeah everybody is i mean like you, you have to be to to be competitive so this is a, talk us through the engine setup on this car because it looks absolutely outrageous to me. So that's a 5.2 Illuminator XS. It's based on like the GT500 platform. Um, five, the, you know, the biggest displacement, uh, I guess, Coyote or whatever uh, variant that they offer. Um, it's about 560 horse uh, stock. And then we went ahead and put like some forged internals in it, um, upgraded forged internals uh, from the Molly and, and Manly um, uh, pistons that were in it. Uh, and then we put the VMP 2650, it's a 2.65 liter supercharger on it. It does about like 960 wheel right now. Um, but still, it's kind of low end of the spectrum for like FD, but. But a reliable setup. 
It is. It it is now. The yeah. beginning of the season yeah, was yeah, a bit yeah. rough, but you know that's what happens when you're sorting new things out, and nobody really runs this platform. So I'm kind of on my own when it comes to figuring out the duty cycle in drift compared to like say drag racing or road racing. Yeah. Like we have a very like rough duty cycle on these engines. So we're kind of on the forefront of that, but it's it's nice to be able to work with Ford and go back and forth and learn things and, and so you have, you have a direct relationship with Ford. I do, I'm very fortunate for that because they really help a lot with the uh, the engine program and, and without them I really, I don't even know what I'd do. That's the difference, I think a big difference that I noticed from Europe to here. Now we do have BMW uh, with the Red Bull Drift Brothers in Drift Masters which is like mind blowing that BMW would go. But all the other manufacturers are going the opposite direction. They're saying, <laughs> we don't want you to run any of this. We want just electric and hybrid and everything. But here, it seems like this sort of the, you know, like GM or Ford, they seem to be still very interested in being part of the motorsport culture, improving well, I think their industry. Ford uh, proper, it definitely wants to go more electric. Um, but I work with the Ford Performance Parts guys. And they're definitely, you know, red-blooded, you know, V8 loving. Yeah, make loads of horsepower, <laughs> yeah. shred tires kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So from the start, obviously, we've looked at a lot of drift cars. So this kind of looks quite conventional in terms of, you know, you cut the front end off, tube it all up. It's not actually even cut. You know, I, all I did was add, like, some uh, reinforcement because the first car that I built, I put all this time and effort into it and then straight away like right into the wall in Long Beach <laughs> and I like push the frame rails over so I'm like hey let me learn from that and let me do a little bit extra bracing so that if I straight away into the wall then we're not going to like move frame rails. Okay so, so you actually just reinforced everything. So this is actually like a factory core support it's yeah, plastic it's, and that's metal. That's pretty rare in yeah. a car back home I would say. Yeah I did it because literally like it's marginal weight savings and I can just go and like buy this piece. Of I was going to say this is very specific for this car so you can just so pull I, I think a lot of people are like straight away I'm going to just cut the front end of the car off and tube, tube it all yeah. out and the way I try to like build drift cars is like hey like how is I going to make my life easier like I don't want to like refabricate a bunch of stuff if I wipe it out. Yeah. I'd rather just go buy like a two hundred dollar piece and be like, and it's plastic, so like you're yeah, gonna, it's, it's not gonna be any lighter than anything. No, else. it's very marginal weight savings. It's very very cool. This obviously, yeah. This this, this, this is, is your this is a modified uh, headlight. This is a, this <laughs> is an air it's, it's, it's yeah. lightweight. Cool as the yeah. This is tight. <laughs> nice. You know, because we, we we were saying, you know, on the way here, Josh and I were saying that to buy a Mustang GT in Ireland, you're talking like. Nearly a hundred thousand dollars. That's you know, wild. Which is, so for us to see you guys like just you battling know, them, battling them, crashing, we're like, to, <laughs> and this has like a carbon fiber wide body, and it's just like, and yeah. even that, like, so we're going over like to the price of these cars of how much they cost to build. Man, I couldn't even imagine like over there. It just, it even to have the shell of it would just be crazy to us. So we, we definitely are fascinated that you guys. I know it's a homegrown brand that you get a little cheaper here, but still to us, it's it's quite an exotic car, and yeah. it's like, especially the newer ones. Um, we Man, we should go on the other side because this side is awful. <laughs> well, I wanted to see the alpha, I, but this I, is I, definitely I, real. <laughs> like, this is what happens. I, like, that's yeah. the fascinating thing to me is like, you know, if you broke one of these in Ireland, you'd be like, oh my god, that's like, let's get another taillight for this. It'd be crazy. And then the uh, back, you pretty have this, standard, yeah. The rear yeah, mount radiator, rear like CNR uh, radiator setup. Um, rear, you know, the fuel cell right above the diff, radium, um, you know, overflows, uh, air separators. Very like pretty standard, you know. Yeah, so it looks it's really very simple back here. Like the yeah, I the, try to like the bash bars, but there's a lot of a lot of room for yeah. movement. Like the whole rear just kind of moves over. This is the bit we always find fascinating when you guys touch the wall. It's like you don't actually build your bash bars out to the corners like we do in no. Europe, where it, it ends up bending the whole car over. You can just leave that flex. Yeah, which we've well, seen on many videos yeah. of you. Like <laughs> we're like, oh, he's dead, and then it's like, oh no, <laughs> he's fine. He's yeah. just come back out again. Yeah, which if it makes sense. I like this cage. I like this. Uh, it's unusual. Yeah, design. I just wanted to get it like out away from me as far as possible. Um, I brought this one out a little bit further than the last uh, car that I built or my, my demo car. So, and then also instead of doing two like you know across through, yeah. I was like, ah, oh, it might be like interesting just to like weld it, do like a, a different style X, and then uh, per the rules, I still had to do some verticals. I was trying to do it without the verticals because I thought it just aesthetically would look cool. But they still made me. This do is really cool. I've actually never seen a cage in a yeah, it's a really like nice one. Oh, it looks really, really interesting, and it's very. I just the modern dash for me blows my mind because all of our cars are always quite old, like you know this old yeah, dash. Yeah, so I found like Ford has like a carbon package, so I was able to like source that out and just kind of keep it stock li looking. I I really like the street style. Yeah. Uh, and and I didn't want it to be like race car 
like fabricated dash or anything like that. I just want it to look literally like just a streetcar. But it's really cool because you can go to like Ford and say, hey, can I have this piece or that piece where to us that would just be, you know, if we went down and even with an S15 and went to Nissan in Ireland, they'd be like, a what? <laughs> like, what? We, didn't, we don't sell this car. Yeah. That is really awesome, man. So you have like, this I have no idea what this is. So this is like a totally different world for us is the off-road world because in Ireland you just get, you know, in trouble for going into someone's. So yeah, this is my uh, floating car. Uh, normally it has tires that are about like this size, this big. So this is um, a rock crawler? This is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is in the process. Um, you know, I finished up all like the uh, final uh, passes on, on the, like welding the chassis together, clear coated it, and now I'm in the middle of like reassembly and I uh, still need to like plumb and wire and whatnot. So these so. are just built from a tube frame. <clears throat> There's no, it's not based on anything. It's no, just, just literally starts out like straight tube like that and just tube like bend notch. And this is this like a force in there? Yeah, so this is uh. This is a Ford EcoBoost 2.3 liter. Ah. Same thing that you'd find in like a Focus RS yep. or a Mustang um, here. But yeah, it's a 2.3. Montune uh, ended up going through and building it. It's got boost line rods, JE pistons. It's got a dry sump on it. Uh, it's built to handle about 700 horsepower, but the Ford Performance Hypo Turbo will do like maybe like 400, um, which will be- but You can get 700 horsepower out of the EcoBoost engine. You can, yeah. The way this is uh, configured, it should handle 700, no problem. I kind of like overbuilt everything. I so that, that if I run it at like a <laughs> lower duty cycle, yeah, it yeah. doesn't, it'll just like last longer. Like this transmission, it's a C, uh, C4 with a Speedmaster case. That thing's built to handle about 1400 horsepower. And so wow. 600, or I mean 400 horse will be like nothing yeah, on it. Yeah, it's not even Same impression. thing with like the transfer case, it's built, that should handle like, there's guys running 1700 horsepower on those transfer cases and it'll never see that, you know? You got the radiator at your back. Yeah, so the seat goes here. Um, so, the, so the actual prop shaft, as you would call it, yeah, um, goes beside you. Correct. That's really bizarre. Like it's not the, ge the gearbox is to your is beside your leg. Because you want all the weight as low as possible, and like obviously I'm not the tiniest person, yeah. so like I want like my weight to be low as well, and then even balance. Um, like you want it to be a little bit more front heavy, but like side to side you want even balance. So that's why we have like the the drivetrain like next to us, fuel cell underneath of us, we're sitting pretty low. Another thing like you gotta think about is like visibility. Cause you're trying to like find these like crazy like lines through the rocks. So you need to see your tire placement. Um, so having the radiator and the heat exchanger bes uh, behind you and having like clear view to like the tires. Oh, so you're looking through to the tires. Yeah, you're looking at where the tires are so that you can like place them to run. Dude, like the like lines. Like a monster truck, right? They look kind of down on a monster truck. They kind of. Uh, they, I guess similar theory yeah. in that, yeah. They kind of can see the tire and they can see down because obviously they're jumping. They want to be able to right. see where they're landing. So yeah. it's the only thing I can reference here because I've seen a monster <laughs> truck once. Yeah, this is like definitely, um, it's not a huge sport but I see a lot of similarities between drifting because it's very technical. Yeah. In drifting, you have to be on point. If you miss your mark, you're like smashing into the wall. If you miss your mark in this, you fall down. You can just tumble down and like hopefully not die. Have you been in a few tumbles? Yeah, absolutely. Scary? Uh, well, I suppose you're quite well. Caged yeah, in. but it is, dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've like, before I started wearing a helmet, dude, I, like whacked my head like ultra hard and I had a big old like egg on my head and it hurt bad. But it's one of those things you like, you get smart. And yeah, so you get older and you get smarter yeah. and you get a helmet. Makes sense. But yeah, this thing is a ton of fun. So these, this has portal axles. These are out of like a Humvee. Um, and then uh, it basically relocates the axle center line about four inches higher. So you get more axle clearance. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. And this is actually about ride height. So you can see how much like axle clearance there is. Wow. You could literally drive over boulders and not even know that they're there. <laughs> and then we have front and rear steer, both full hydraulic. Uh, Cause this thing is literally turning 42 inch tires. Like when massive. You say front and rear steer, is that all from just the one? Yeah, so this little like lever here is your rear steer valve. So you can just do rear steer. Yeah, so this is like a joystick, you know? Wow. And then obviously your steering wheel is like normal for the, for the front. And you, but, like, you can just go 
is there specific times that you can you just go yourself into the desert yeah, and so just do it just yourself? Open BLM area where you can just go run trails whenever, anytime you want. Uh, really, it's just that's, open that's area. Cool. And that's quite different than drifting because drifting you kind of have to wait for Good there track. to be an actual day or whatever. I mean, or you can go on the street and then get arrested. Yeah. And then, Whereas, but that's, and I'd imagine <laughs> it would be similar in this. But if the case is saying you can't just go through someone's back back lawn, just. But at the same time, that's the freedom of it that you can just go whenever you want. You that's amazing. Nice. And then you have a full shop set up here with uh, this is the stuff Nemi and Josh very rarely understand we, we, so yeah I mean I, say, I basically saw <laughs> stuff like that we don't know much about this stuff but we understand when we see it that this, you can yeah I mean it, I don't have like the fanciest stuff but I literally have everything to I mean I built this car here and I built this here um, so you know, I, like a water jet, uh, this is actually a plasma, so I just cleaned oh, it up. I was going to say, you, you said you don't have the fanciest stuff, you have a plasma cutter, which well, I don't think anyone in a garage I, in Ireland has. Yeah. Alright, I guess it's relative, right? <laughs> like, I'm in California, so I go to like somebody's shop and they have like full CNC machines and like yeah, all this yeah. like stuff. And yeah, I've definitely like worked, I've been doing this like such a long time that I've worked my way up and I definitely invest into like equipment to make my life easier. So instead of taking like a piece of sheet metal over to the bandsaw and like bandsawing stuff out and then like drilling holes i can just sit on the laptop and like type in a bunch of stuff and then push print and then that's perfect the, then it comes out and and then i'm like oh i was slightly off i don't have to spend another two hours like building it i can just be like oh let me move this hole and then push print and then it's like perfect now that makes much more sense and you built that the whole fd car and maintain it in here right here yeah. which is crazy because i know a lot of people have Big, 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 you know, from the outside looking in, but this, this is still very similar to what we do in Europe. Someone just has a workshop. And yeah, I mean, like I that. try to keep my expenses down. I mean, it's expensive. Dude, this sport is like hella expensive, you know. <laughs> I can as you, imagine at FD as, level. As you know, but I do majority of stuff myself, and um, I do have a crew that comes in on the weekends and helps. Like, I literally, I couldn't do this all by myself, no. obviously. So, but I have uh, my spotter, uh, my data, um, the, he does all my data and engine tuning, which is Jason from Link ECU, a uh, really good friend of mine. I've known him for like 22 years. Yeah. Um, so he comes into all the events. Um, my other good buddy, uh, Tim Folkerts, uh, he does all my suspension and he's like my crew chief. So I prototyped the front suspension and then he designed the rear suspension, but he does all the production of it uh, in, in his shop in Iowa. So he comes in on the weekends and then I typically have like a Rover where it's either a buddy um, will come and help like change tires, like fill fuel, it's like that's, it's that's crazy. Sort of to me, so we've had a long relationship with Link. Link have been like one of our partners for a very, very long time. And to me, it was really strange when I changed all the Ford, I don't know, like it was like some sort of tuning system on the RTR car okay, that I had. Um, it was old and it was weird. And then we changed it all to Link and we changed it all to actually 2JZ uh, wiring and coils and everything in the mm. car, which was strange. But it's the, the most reliable thing I've had since. Oh, it's been fantastic. Like, so I have never, like, we would just say it's so funny because we have a lot of cars, like the guys on the channel know, and none of them ever work properly, except this Mustang, which is running Link, <laughs> and 900 horsepower. It can't even stop being 900 horsepower because it's a centrifugal supercharger, so it just does that. Yeah. And you can't control the boost. And every time we turn it on, it works. It never gives any issues. And it's ever, when we had it before the link, it used to break down and misfire and all that good stuff that we would just be going, oh, great, this is just what 900 horsepower cars do. And then we but put the whole link be. system in, nothing. And even my Corvette now, nothing. Everything just works as it should. So it's weird for me because I always associated link at the start with, you know, Japanese cars to a certain extent coming from that side of things in Australia and New Zealand. Now to see them on Mustangs, Corvettes and stuff, it's very cool because it's a really good system. It is, it is, yeah. I mean, so my demo car, the old car, we were running a factory ECU because um, that was a pretty much the only thing that had the strategy to run that engine because it's quad cams, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. But uh, over a couple of years, uh, we worked on the engine dyno, like locally with Jason and we came up with a strategy to run the Coyote. So when we went, when we built this car, um, I was like straight away I'm going to run the link system on it. We run the Thunder uh, with the AIM dash and, and like that whole setup and we were able to get control of this engine and we've been running on it like for two years now and literally like that is the last thing I'm going to worry about. Is it, I think I, I would obviously it seems biased because we're, we're partners with link but it's the only thing I would look at on a car because it's recently on my Sylvia it's on an old school Apexi Power FC and you've just no control it just mm. runs like crap 
And then the minute we put links on stuff, it's just like, oh, it's like a modern technology upgrade. Everything works great. And I can just see everything, even though I don't understand all of it, and <laughs> people know that. I can tell when something's going wrong. That's the most important thing. I don't need to know what it all does, but as long as it shows me warnings when something's going wrong. But it's even wrong. like the price point, too, because you have the power of, like, say, a Motec, which yep. is so much more money. And that was, like, the, the biggest thing that I was intrigued on is, you know, the power that it has and the, the, all the different stuff you can add to it but you don't have to like pay to like unlock O2 sensors, which you obviously need O2 sensors, or you don't have to pay for like a map sensor. You don't have to pay for this or pay for that. It's just like you get it and it's just open. You can literally do whatever you want with it, which is pretty dope. I think that um, like your car, for example, Josh, like your MX-5 runs the same ECU as Justin's FD. I think mine's car. a bit overkill on my car. In fact, you're just saying you keep hey, yeah, this. Yeah. But you, yeah, you got room for improvement. Room for but it is, it goes to show that well, it's you not can like. You take that ECU to like literally whatever. All yeah. you got to do is build a harness. You could literally take that ECU out, put it in a different car. You don't have to necessarily have like no. a single ECU or like a ECU per car. Like you could just, like, if, say you needed more inputs and outputs, at least you have that. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know? Well, that's what they were saying that. Well, they gave, us, have they gave us the option because we put in GPS and we put in like, you know, handbrake sensors, brake sensors, all sorts of stuff that t at the time I was like, maybe this is overkill, but it's not ex massively more expensive hey, to have it. It is good though. And like you get it back and you go, oh, like we were saying before, you can see if you break the diff, mm. which I think this, I always said that Link is almost taking away the excuses from drivers. <laughs> I'm saying, oh, that diff was so on. Maybe, we, we, it, we, some we, people may not want that. Yeah, they go, <laughs> oh, that diff was uh, definitely on the way out. It was, you know, it was, a bit, it was a bit ropey. And they go, yeah, you were on the handbrake at full throttle here with and no clutch in. <laughs> and it's like, oh, right, that was me. Yeah, so at least yeah. good to know. So it's awesome to see uh, someone from the Link family and get to catch up with them. And it's so funny to see the difference in machinery we were seeing across all these different types of cars. You go to the Middle East and you see crazy Link builds there. This is quite an American muscle build. On This is going to run Link as well. So this is a Link. So this is going to be running the GDI, which is the direct injection uh, Link. I'm just going to put it out there to people in the comments that if the Ford EcoBoost 2.3 four-cylinder can run 700 horsepower with work done, is it the new SR20? That's all I'm just saying. Dude, these, all I'm saying. these engines are crazy impressive, even at like a 400 horsepower level, because the torque is so high. Like, yeah, but like you know, we, we, I mean, everything in Europe is it's an SR20, and then it's an Orbi or a 2J, and that's. Well, the problem you don't have with these is like the rocker popping yeah. the rockers. Like that. I've, is the, I've been down that road <laughs> many a time. I've had I've had rockers in my hands at many events. Right. And that's the thing with like. And I think these are fairly affordable. Yeah, too. but it's a cheap engine to a certain extent because SR20 comes with all the JDM tax on it. This is a brand new engine. Brand so new. like, you're not gonna buy a brand new SR20. It's gonna be from a 94 car mm -hmm. that you have no idea the mileage. Then you gotta build it all. But if you could just buy an engine that's brand new and it comes with 400 horsepower and then a little tune or whatever and you get it to a different turbo or whatever. I don't know, I'm, I'm looking at, we were talking about the, the BMW six cylinder from the M4 being like the new 2J. This could be like the new SR20. Maybe. I'm just thinking about it aloud going, I'd love to do a project with a four-cylinder Ford. Well, Link has a solution for yeah, it. Well, so. that, stop! Started setting me down the road. Put, <laughs> put, put one in a Sylvia. Hey, it could be could be a little controversial. Right, right. Well, I think the one thing I want to say is thank you very much for showing us around. It's been really interesting to see. I don't know, like how it happens behind the scenes, because we always see the car is just there at the event, and we have no idea what happened behind the scenes. But um, to see the car to kind of meet up with someone from the Link ECU family and also see the rock crawler and stuff. That's awesome. So thank you so much for yeah, uh, for coming and uh, showing us everything. And uh, if you made me think about buying a Mustang, you've made me thinking about putting, uh, maybe trying the EcoBoost engine yeah, as a new SR20. If you need any help like finding one of these, like uh, I wouldn't mind helping sort that out because it sounds like it's maybe like difficult to get one in Ireland. It is difficult to get one in Ireland. Well, this is where we run into problems, folks, because I end up meeting people and I get new ideas. But anyway, <laughs> thanks so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we've got some more shop tours coming up in future episodes, so stay tuned.